Now, there's debate on this because technically he may have risen on Saturday night, but in the Jewish realm of definition, that technically is still Sunday because the way they measure the days is by the setting of the sun. So what we might refer to as late Saturday night, others refer to as Sunday, but it's not a primary dogma that you have to worry about. But if you ever hear people debating about whether uh, you know, Jesus rose on Saturday or Sunday, just remember uh, if Jewish people are answering that, they may give you one definition. And if Christians following a Gregorian calendar answer that, they may give you another. And the only thing you need to remember is that Jews, uh, the timing of the day ends with the setting of the sun and not midnight. Now even the date of Passover is not easily understood because theoretically uh, Passover, again, in the Jewish calendar, not the Gregorian calendar, but in the Jewish calendar always occurs on the 14th of the month of Nisan, which is not a month that uh, we observe in the Gregorian calendar, but it also has to correspond to the first full moon. But in theoretical practice, it didn't always work out perfectly that way as far as the 14th day of Nisan and the full moon. So as a result, the rabbis were given the final authority to decide when Passover would be celebrated. Now, as you know, if you're a student of the Bible, when Jesus came, uh, the Jews did not accept him as their Messiah. And so those who became followers of Christ, though originally the, the mass numbers were primarily Jews, Gentiles also became followers of Christ. And the Christians did not like being told how to celebrate their Christian feasts based upon the rabbi's authority because there was a division. The Christians obviously had received Christ as the promised Messiah, received him as Lord and as Savior, and his resurrection, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven gave them the proof that they needed to know that that Jesus wasn't a lunatic. It, it's all provable. And I don't have time to do that in this study. I have many studies on our YouTube channel and on our podcast channel that deal with the evidences and the proofs and the historicity and the authenticity of the Christian faith that I hope you'll study when you have the time. But Christians didn't like being dependent upon the pronouncements of the rabbis on how to celebrate their Christian feasts, so they came up with another way of determining their date. Now again, Jewish people have their method of securing their date. Christians have their method. And the Christian method was decided that Easter would be celebrated on the first Sunday after the full Paschal moon, which uh, is the spring equinox, full moon. Not important that you remember all of the, uh, the details to this, but just so you'll understand, because I've had several that have asked, why isn't Easter on the same date? Why isn't Lent observed the same time? Why does the time of Ash Wednesday change and so on? Well, it's for this reason. So the thing that I want you to remember, how do they set the dates for Ash Wednesday? How do they set the dates for Lent and the Lenten season? As Christians, the first Sunday after, never on, the first Sunday after the Paschal full moon. And on the Gregorian calendar, the one that we use, uh, Easter is the first Sunday, uh, and it always works this way after the Paschal full moon, which is the first full moon on or after March 21st. So I just wanted to briefly answer that question because several have asked. That's why Easter always falls between March 22nd and April 25th, which is quite the variance of time. But uh, if you've ever wondered why Easter uh, is celebrated differently from year to year as far as a date is, that's why. 
but it always is between March 22nd and April 25th. And then lastly in our study today, and again, we're answering the question in this study, should Christians observe Ash Wednesday and Lent? So let me break that down for you. Now, the length of the Lenten fast was established all the way back in the 4th century as 46 days. Uh, when you subtract the Sundays out of that season, it's 40 days. But when you take the total season from beginning to end, it's 46 days. Now, during Lent, participants typically uh, eat sparingly or give up particular foods or uh, participate in denying themselves from uh, various habits, uh, all focused around penance and prayer and fasting and uh, you know, looking inward and trying to be more consecrated. You know, I remember as a, as a kid growing up in school that during this time, uh, the cafeteria uh, served fish on uh, Fridays. And, uh, you know, being a meat and potatoes kind of guy, I was a little offended. I didn't quite get it. And now as uh, a student of the Bible and someone who's been involved in theology for four plus decades and continue to study, uh, now I understand. But uh, I always thought as a kid, I said, you know, this is unfair for one, you know, religious group of people uh, to make me uh, eat their menu. And looking back on it, the only thing I'm grateful for is that they weren't vegetarians. At least we got some protein in the cafeteria on Friday. But, you know, many kids don't know. And so some of you that are listening, you're old enough, you have children, and you have grandchildren. And this would be something you could explain to them so that they don't grow up as I did. My parents, I don't ever remember my parents giving me the explanation that I'm giving to you today, and I'm certainly not dishonoring my parents. I'm just telling you that all the way through school, right through high school, I was a little irritated that for a certain season of the year, Lent season, that uh, I was going to have to eat fish every Friday at school and, and no more cheeseburgers and, and uh, no more meat. But during Lent, people make a commitment. Now, the commitments vary from sincere uh, to ridiculous. I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to watch Netflix. Uh, during Lent, you know, wow, what an incredible sacrifice. Uh, surely your reward in heaven is too great to be measured. Uh, some people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm only going to use my cell phone during uh, work hours. And, you know, people have various things. I'm not going to eat chocolate cake, or I'm not going to eat desserts, or I'm going to abstain from sugar. You know, very few people uh, understand the concept of fasting and prayer. And I would encourage you when you have time, if you're a new follower of our content, study our series on what does the Bible say about fasting and prayer. Because giving up chocolate cake for Lent is not fasting. Uh, not watching Netflix during Lent is not fasting. Uh, not having sugar in your coffee during Lent is not fasting and so on. And so there are many people who think they're making these religious observances uh, sacred by giving something up, and it, it really is a poor uh, example of self-sacrifice and self-denial. But the Lent season basically is six weeks of Christian self-discipline and self-denial. Now, the austerity of the Lenten season was seen uh, in the Old Testament. And, and much of how the Lenten season is carried out does have roots in the Bible. I read to you the passage out of Esther. Let's go into the book of Jeremiah and uh, let me show you another uh, verse. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 26. The Bible says, O my people, dress yourselves up in burlap and sit among the ashes. Mourn and weep bitterly. As for the loss of an only son, for suddenly the destroying armies will be upon you. But through the centuries, uh, moving away from these initial core values of, 
of people who loved God and, and God and religion and faith were a part of the very uh, community that they were raised in. You know, it went from this holy, sacred, extreme self-denial. Uh, in the modern church, it, it, it actually, uh, for many, is pretty trivial, trivial isn't it? it? It really is not what we might call true penance. And the other thing that I want to address is that uh, many Catholics, and I love the Catholic people. I mention this uh, because uh, Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season is, is very much respected and observed by Catholic people, and not only Catholic people, as I've mentioned, but if you're Catholic or if you come from a Catholic background, uh, I love you, God loves you. This is not in any way uh, an assault upon uh, your faith. Uh, I would just be clear in telling you that none of us should have a greater allegiance to denominational dogma than we do to what is in the Bible. I always make that clear. I love people, even if you have no church at all, even if you're an unsafe person, even if you're a person who hates preachers or hates church, or you consider yourself an agnostic or atheist. And believe it or not, we have many agnostics and atheists who write in and tell me that they're listening. And uh, I don't hate you. You're not my enemy. You may not have the same point of view, but uh, one day you're going to find out that there really was a heaven, there really is a hell, and there's only one way to have right relationship with God, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. That's not my opinion. If you study the Bible, it leaves no other room for any other interpretation other than that. Acts 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so I'm mentioning uh, the Catholics in this teaching because they have taken great ownership of Ash Wednesday and of the Lenten season, perhaps more than any other denomination. But I do it only in historic context not in any type of adversarial uh, or uh, attack personally against you. My wife was born and raised Catholic. But again, when you stand before God in eternity's morning, He's not going to ask you what denomination you ascribe to. He's going to ask you what did you do with His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. But the Catholic Church teaches that giving something up for Lent is a way uh, that we obtain God's blessing. And on that point, biblically, the scripture does not agree. Listen very carefully and don't get angry. The Bible teaches me that you can't buy anything from God. Nothing that we do buys or earns or merits the grace and the favor of God. We must remember that the Bible teaches us that grace cannot be earned. Grace is the gift of God and the gift of righteousness. Let me show you a passage in the Bible that teaches that, and there are multiple. But go into the fifth chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 5, and go down to verses 17 through 21. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. For the sin of this one man, Adam caused death to rule over many. Pause right there. It's talking about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of time. The very first man that God created out of the dust of the earth was Adam. And then later in the scripture we were told it's not good for man to be alone. And out of Adam he created Eve. And the Bible said he created them male and female, and I might add, that has not changed over the centuries. You are either male or female, and you didn't get to choose that. Your biology chose that. We live in a day and an age in which that is very controversial. You know, 50 years ago, that would have been so commonly stated that no one would have raised an eyebrow, but it just goes to show you how far man has wandered away from the precepts of God and divine design. You were not uh, an ev 
evolved species from monkeys or from, from apes or from any other mammal. You didn't come from some muck in a prehistoric swamp and develop into humanity. You were created in the image of God and it's important that you understand that because you'll never believe that you were created for greatness if you don't believe that your Creator was great. But I am here to tell you the Bible still says God is great and greatly to be praised. And because we were created in His image, once you come back to right relationship with God, and we're going to pray in just a moment, but once God and new life for everyone. Verse 19, because one person disobeyed God, that's talking about Adam, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, that's Jesus, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. And so the one thing about Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season that is not biblical is that we, through our self-denial, through our penance, and through our fasting, and through our prayers, etc., we do not buy blessing from God by any work that we have done. I also have another thing that I need to teach you from the Bible that is often embraced by people who celebrate Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season, that violates the scripture, and that would be uh, the cross of ashes that are placed upon people's heads. Now, I'm not condemning people that do that. I am just telling you that if you are going to believe that the Bible is our rule for faith and conduct, and not what denominations have added to it or taken away from it, then you need to understand that the Bible would actually teach against that. You say, where in the Bible does it teach against that? Well, let's go into the scriptures, Matthew chapter 16, the very first book in the New Testament, if you're a brand new Christian, Matthew's gospel, and the 16th chapter, or the 6th chapter, go down to verses 16 through 18. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Jesus said, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward that they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private and your Father who sees everything will reward you. And so as Jesus is teaching on prayer and fasting, which is a Christian discipline of self-denial and self-sacrifice, Jesus said it shouldn't be obvious. And he said, 
wash your face. And so based on what Jesus taught us about true biblical fasting and prayer and self-denial that's acceptable in the eyes of God, I personally have a conviction about the cross of ashes being placed on my forehead. For me, I could never do that because I would find that as a direct straying. I don't want to say rebellion because I don't believe many people do it in rebellion against God. I think the vast majority of people who observe Ash Wednesday in the Lenten season, they're not rebelling against God. They're trying to draw closer to God. So I'm not condemning you. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you that by the truth of the Bible, the ash cross upon the forehead makes it obvious. And Jesus said, don't be obvious. And he said, wash your face. So you couldn't have a cross of ashes and wash your face without that cross being washed off. So I personally could never observe Ash Wednesday by having an ash cross placed upon my forehead because it directly violates the teaching of Jesus Christ. Fasting and prayer and self-deniable and observing Christian disciplines are a good thing. And there's certainly nothing wrong with setting some time aside to draw closer to God. And I close with this. There's one other piece of biblical wisdom that I want to give you before we pray. And that is, I don't believe it's a sin. I don't believe it's a sin. I don't believe anyone can open the Bible and say it's sin to observe Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season. I do believe, as I've already taught you, that the cross of ashes painted on a forehead is pretty much in direct opposition to the humility and the privacy and the dignity that Jesus gave us concerning penance, repentance, prayer, and fasting. So again, my convictions based upon the very words of Christ and the teaching of the Bible would not allow me to observe Ash Wednesday with a visible ashen cross painted on my forehead. But I would never condemn a follower of the Lord who is setting aside a period of time, whether it's the 46 days of Lenten season, 40 days minus the Sundays, I certainly would never condemn anybody for doing that. I, I would applaud them for taking time to draw closer to God. But I would also, as a teacher of the Bible for multiple decades, I would call you to self-examination. And that would be this. Living a holy, consecrated, repentant, self-denying life should not be something we do during Lent and then go back to our carnal lifestyles after. The call to be a follower of Christ is all of your life, every day, every moment. You are consecrated to the Lord. And so I would warn you to be aware from any teaching that allows you a window of time to show prayer, fasting, repentance, penance, self-denial, self-sacrifice, etc. But doesn't clearly tell you that holiness is a part of Christian commitment 365 days a year. We should be holy year-round. We should observe the teachings of Christ year-round. We should be consecrated holy year-round. We should be repentant for sin year round. We should strive to draw closer to God year round. And so in the conclusion of our study, is it wrong for Christians to observe Ash Wednesday and Lent? No, it's not wrong. There are some parts of this practice, as I've shown you, that violate the teachings of Christ and violate the Bible. But is it a sin that would send somebody to hell? No. 
because many people that do this do this in total innocence and they've never heard anybody teach what I'm teaching you today. I would encourage you Now 